Well, I want to try this morning to deal with Karl Barth particularly in the development of his thinking and then particularly with his church dogmatics. And then this afternoon in the last hour, I'll try to deal briefly. I want to call your attention to this little book, Christ the Tiger, and Jürgen Moltmann, Theology of Hope. Now, we already have seen back as a background for all of this modern thinking Kant's philosophy, which means that there is an I-it dimension, which is the field of science, and there is an I-thou dimension, which is the field of human freedom, in which man meets God, person to person, we're told, person to person confrontation. Emil Brunner has a book, Truth as Encounter, Truth as Encounter, Die Wahrheit aus Begegnung. Truth is not, he says, systematic statement of doctrines in the I-it dimension. People have thought that. Orthodox people have unfortunately thought that and still believe that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are meeting God not in this realm, which Bart speaks of as the realm of his story, but we meet God primarily through Christ in what he calls the realm of Geschichte. Now, when God, however, comes from that Geschichte, he comes into this realm of his story where we are, and he comes wholly into it. When the Incarnation takes place, it is not the second person of the Trinity who adopts, adapts to his divine nature, human nature, and dies and rises in this human nature, but it is the whole triune God that is exhaustively revealed. Because if he's revealed at all, he's got to be exhaustively revealed. In this world, you either know all things, you can deduct all things logically, or you know nothing. On the other hand, when exhaustively revealed, he is still wholly hidden, because if he were not wholly hidden, he were not God. Now that, and therefore you have God wholly hidden, wholly revealed. That's the dialectical principle. We've seen that before, Kant. They speak of dogmatism. Kant speaks of his position as criticism. The 19th century is that of dialecticism, and then you have Hegelian philosophical dialecticism, you have Kierkegaard's dualistic existentialist dialecticism, which was the current, has now been for some time, adopted in Germany, and the great uh, existentialist thinker, of course, is Martin Heidegger, whose book, Sein und Zeit, has been tremendously influential in Germany. Now, he has influenced particularly Bultmann, whose thinking is practically modeled after this work of Sein und Zeit, but he has indirectly influenced all other modern existentialist thinkers, philosophers, and theologians. Now, when Barth was a young man, as we saw last time, he studied under Hermann and Karnak, who were themselves the spokesmen, the chief spokesmen of liberal theology. Now, liberal theology, or modernist theology, was already Kantian theology. Schleiermacher, the father of modern theology, and Albrecht Ritschel, who wrote in the middle of the century, they were had turned the whole system of doctrine upside down so that man is now projecting a God into the other world. But they nevertheless thought that God is very much present with us on the horizontal level in our consciousness. And so, when Bart graduated, he thought he had no gospel to preach. So he took a clerical position first, but soon took a church, and in Southernville, Switzerland, a little town, he read Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans. And there he says he finds that God speaks to men straight down from heaven, think recht von oben, and we are such as must receive that on its own authority. We must not try to prove the existence of God, and then after that add to it the idea of Christianity. We must start with God. Our God is holy other, guns under. That was the set expression of this. Guns under. Man, holy other, God, God is in Himmel, du bist auf Erde. God is in heaven, you are on earth. And you must always remember that. And so, many Reformed people, Christian people who were Reformed, thought here is a wonderful new development. Here's a great modern theologian who is once more receiving the theology of the Reformation, and notably the theology of John Calvin. On the other hand, 
here was a Lutheran who wrote a book on Bart at the beginning who said, well, we mustn't have this. This is Calvinism. Well, it was neither Reformation theology. It was not Calvinism, nor was it anything remotely, I shouldn't say resembling it, unless, alas, it does resemble it precisely in terminology and form, but in content it is conscience theology. It is man-centered theology. Now, that's my thesis with respect to the whole of, of Bart's development. Now, the first book, I said, is Romans, and that was patterned after Kierkegaard's philosophy, and he says that in the introduction. If I have any philosophy, he says, I have the philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard, who says that God is qualitatively different from man. But then, after he had rewritten Romans, and says that in the second edition he didn't leave one word unaltered, then he already begins to see that he has to have something less philosophical, that though existentialism speaks of a wholly other God, it is still speculative, he says. It is not yet sufficiently biblical. And so he's beginning at this stage to think of a more biblical theology, and he's now moved from a church to a seminary in Germany. He's become their Herr Professor. And their Herr Professor, every Herr Professor has to have a dogmati. Otherwise, he isn't a Herr Professor. <laughs> so, uh, there were other reasons, too. But just the same, he began to write his dogmati. Now, he was a tremendously productive fellow. He didn't wait till he was 70 began before he started writing something. You mustn't wait that long or you'll never write something. Most of us wait that long. Now, therefore, he began that, and that is in a black cover, and he has the work, it's volume one, and that, he calls it the prolegomena. Now, however, or let me say first, in this book, he attacks Schleiermacher and Ritchell, the consciousness theologians, as he calls them. Consciousness theologians. They start from the human consciousness as being sufficient to itself, intelligible to itself, he says, and then they project to God. And there was, as you know, a man named Feuerbach, who was a philosopher who wrote a book on the essence of religion and on another book on the essence of Christianity, and he laughed at these consciousness theologians. He says, you people think you're theologians. You're talking about God, but you're really ventriloquists. You speak from within out. You project to God, like on the 4th of July, you throw up fireworks, and when you're a grown-up and an adult and the children don't know any better, they sit there, and they, when they, those fireworks come down, they say, oh... Straight down from heaven. Now, you rascals, you grown-ups who always deceive the children, know perfectly well that you have shot up this thing first, don't you see? And then it comes Sengrek von Oven. Well, now, Feuerbach says, you consciousness theologians have shot up your God first. He's just a projection. And Feuerbach was 100% right. This was what Schleiermacher did, and what Ritchell did, what Hermann did, what Heinrich did, what many other of the neo not the neo-Orthodox, historical modernists did. So certainly, when Brunner, who was then with Bach, and they organized a paper or a magazine, Switzerland Zeitung, between the times, which means between eternity and time, the dialectical relation of God to man. Then Brunner wrote a book on Schleiermacher, Die Mystik und das Wort, Mysticism and the Word. Wer Mystik hat, he says, he's, who's got music, he says, wer Musik hat, and Mystik, why do you need the word anymore? In other words, he says, uh, Schleiermacher and the consciousness theologians are musicians, they're aestheticists. They project a beautiful idea of a beautiful God. Everything is coming out very beautifully, but they do not have the God of the Reformation or the God of the Scriptures. So by, in this period, however, Brunner and Barth began to separate. They had cooperated, and Bultmann was with them. Bultmann writes at this time in favor of them and in their magazine. But at this, by this time... 
Bruner had begun to worry that Bart was going a bit too extreme. And so he says, he wrote an article, he says, we have an andre Aufgabe. We have to be sure to start with God speaking to us from above, revelation. But we also have to make plain to people, to the cultural consciousness of the age, to the culture despisers of the Christian religion, that what we're saying is sensible, apologetics. In other words, was a second task, an andere Aufgabe. And then Bart couldn't take it, and so he wrote a pamphlet with the title Nine. Nine. No. That's all. We don't need any other task. We have no other task. We have one task, and one task only, to preach the gospel. We start with das erste Gebot, the first commandment, and that's God's word, and we accept it on his authority. And if you don't like it, Emo, you can stay and engage in that under Aufgabe, ask for me in my house. <laughs> we will go down absolutely into absolute submission. So he cleans house, that is, he cleans out Emil Brunner and others with him, but he also cleans house with respect to his own dogmatic. So he starts, when he goes on, he doesn't write volume two, but he starts now with this kirchliche dogmatic, church dogmatic, which means we who are believers write for the church of Jesus Christ. Whether the world will listen or will not listen, that's a secondary concern to us. First of all, it is our task to speak the truth as Christ speaks it to and in the church. That's why he calls us the kirchliche dogmatic, church dogmatics. Now, then he says, we must not have any speculation at all. He apologizes for the fact that he has had, in the earlier writings, his work on Romans, a, quali a philosophy, even the existentialist philosophy of Kierkegaard, and that in the dogmatic, he has still made use of a certain amount of speculative philosophy to justify his position. Henceforth, forevermore, I am done in my own thinking and in my own writing uh, with all philosophy, with all speculation, and I cut cables, as Carnell would say, cut cables with all who are willing, unwilling to go with me. Now then he starts this terrific work, which he has been unable to finish, but which is, I suppose, the most comprehensive work that has ever been written in the history of the Christian church. It is, he proposed to write five volumes. He has written practically finished four, and he has piles and piles of manuscript material, I'm told, on the last volume, but he wasn't able to finish it. Now, I want to go over these, the contents of these four volumes, the main contents of them, very shortly, and then you can ask questions if you will. Now, volume one is divided into two parts. Omnia Gallia divisa est in tres partes. But Omnia Dogmatica divisa est in duo partes. Now, every volume has two parts in it, except later on they get three and four. But here they have only two. In other words, I wish I had it here to show you. What he covered in the prolegomena in this first dogmatic, in about 700 pages, a mere 700 pages, he now takes about 18 to 1900. And the second volume of these, I mean the second book, is a book of about 1,100 pages with maybe 500 of them in fine print. Now, in the fine print, he makes an Aus Einander Setzung with everybody, sundry history of doctrine with Emil Brunner, with the Roman Catholics, particularly with the Roman Catholics, who, he says, believe in the analogia entis. And that, he says to me, is the spirit of the Antichrist. So much he was against the Roman Catholics. And why? Because they have not natural theology. I was once, I spent an evening and a night in Basel, and I called up at Bart's house, asked if I could see him, but he was out of town, so I was walking the streets aimlessly. And I ran into a few of Karl Barth's students. And then we began a little conversation, and they're talking about Emil Brunner. Ah, and a truly a tale of heat. And I'll... 
natural, natural theology. Who believes in natural theology? These boys were great disciples of Barth. There is no natural theology. Now, you remember, analogy, analogia entis, is the synthesis of Greek philosophy with Christian theology. And Barth, again, is right in throwing that out of the window. And a natural theology is a false, man-centered interpretation of God's revelation. Synthesized with, mixed with, the revelation of God, don't you see? Well, so negatively, Bart was altogether right. Throughout, he has been opposing the Roman Catholics, except now, as I shall show in his latest writing, now that the Roman Catholics, uh, two of them, two outstanding ones, Hans Kuhn and Hans Urs von Balthasar, have written important books in which they say that their Roman Catholic theology is really the same as Bart's theology. Since that, you haven't seen a thing against Romanism in the church dogmatics anymore. Well, all right, what is this? Well, God is his revelation, point number one, namely, that God is not God in himself, as the Orthodox says, not a mountain lake with water, inaccessible to us who live in the desert here below. God is his revelation. There is no... God in himself as deep kind God and sich, and there is no God that has a counsel in himself as deep kind decretum absolutum, but there is a God who stands inherently per se ab initio from scratch in relation to man. He is that relation. He is Jesus Christ. Therefore the Trinity, and he discusses the Trinity at length and the incarnation and the outpouring of the Spirit. The Incarnation is not an event in his story, but it is God overflowing in his being, coming to us in this world. And the Holy Spirit is it's Pentecost. Pentecost is the Holy Spirit working in man, working in the world. Now, then God's presence through Christ in this world, revelation. That revelation is in the nature of the case through Christ, and therefore, everything is Christ-centered. This whole dogmatic is, as he speaks of it, Christ-centered. But it does, it does not mean, when he says Christ-centered, that it is in Jesus of Nazareth a direct revelation of God, but it is the Christ event we shall see more clearly presently. But I want particularly to call your attention that in this volume, where he speaks particularly of Scripture, he says the Bible is the Word of God. Now, how much better that is, is it not, than the modernists who said the Bible contains the Word of God. And we often criticize the modernists for that. We say, well, that means that you can pick and choose out of the Bible what you like, you say, is the Word of God, and what you do not like is not for you the Word of God. Now, here is a great theologian, and he says, with us, the Orthodox people, the Bible is the Word of God. Now, there isn't anything that has more frequently been misunderstood about Karl Barth than just that little word is, because he does specifically not mean what you mean by that word is, and he tells you that he doesn't. Just as we see that when you come to the Incarnation, that he actualizes Chalcedon, so he actualizes the is. That is to say, what is is? What is is? Well, is is what Immanuel Kant says is is. <laughs> Namely, it is God is not, has no being apart from himself, but reality is one event. Therefore, you must never, and this is negative, identify God's revelation with any ordinary calendar event in his story. That meaning of the word is, is out. Therefore, Karl Barth is not returning to the Protestant Orthodox Reformation point of view of revelation of God in Scripture at all. Now you see how deceptive words are, because certainly it would seem that on this score he can pass the test. You remember in one of the wars of Israel, when uh, the Israelites had been victorious, was it Gideon who was it? 
and the people coming back, crossing the Jordan, if they said Sibboleth, that was one thing. If they said Shibboleth, which one, which one do they have to say to pass in? Huh? Shibboleth, huh? Good for you, Mr. Morse. No, you'll pass. You'll pass. <laughs> So don't you see? Otherwise, off with the head, if you don't say shibboleth. Well, now, we Orthodox people say, if a person says God is the word of God, you're a fundy. You can come on in. If you say, don't say is, you say contains off with the head, then you're a modernist. Now, we've got to have a new way of testing Orthodoxy. We've got to become a little more critical and a little more discerning of the spirits that be around us, that Satan comes as an angel of light to deceive, if it were possible, the very elect of God. Now, I'm, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that Carabart is Satan or that he is satanic or anything of the sort. I am saying that Satan can use such misinterpretation as means by which he deceives people. Dr. Baker, a good friend of mine, who has a program on the uh, David Baker, you know him, I guess, splendid fellow, well, he thought this was it, this was fine. Any number of people have been constantly thinking that Karl Barth is orthodox on the doctrine of Scripture. Now, he is so outspokenly antagonistic to the orthodox doctrine that he speaks of doctrophana as gift, as gift, the profane givenness. You see, if you were to mean by saying that the Bible is the Word of God, then you would be one of those beati possidentes, those blessed possessors, those miserable Reformed theologians in the Netherlands that put Hilkag out of the church because he wouldn't accept the historicity of the Genesis narrative because they said the Bible is the Word of God in that givenness sense. Now, this is where the very the people who have tried to concern Presbyterians in the North, they have been utterly deceived by this point, apparently, because they thought that by doctoring up the statement that the committee of Princeton Cemetery people and others, under the influence of Dr. Hendry and Dr. De who was it, the other gentleman, chairman of the committee, I forget, at any rate, they got this changed a little, too, so they got the expression, the word of God written. And so they thought, now we can live with it. And Dr. Gerstner apparently thinks he can live with this thing. Well, you can't live with it, because is this you have no gospel to live with. If this is the word of God, because there is then no word of God in any final sense at all. Now, this is where we have to learn to be critical. That doesn't mean to be negative. We would rather not be negative, but it is our task our responsibility as defenders of the faith of the once for all delivered to the saints and of the children of God who cannot in general be expected thus to understand is our task as ministers and as teachers to alert the poor simple people against this sort of thing. Well now, this holds in principle mit ambition on the warden for all the other things. This is the thing he said, that profane as gift, the profane givenness to which historic orthodoxy has been committed, over against his activistic, living, speaking voice of God. He says, if Christ is really to speak to you, then you must not identify his words with the once for all given words of the scriptures. Now, and that is all the time we have for volume one. Now then we get to volume two, in which he deals with the doctrine of God, and in which he deals also with the doctrine of election, the two parts of it. In the first part of volume two, he deals particularly with the attributes of God. Now he says, look, orthodoxy has been at a loss with this doctrine of God, because they had a God who lives up is like a mountain lake up there, and what good does it do us down here in the desert if there is no opening to let that water out? Now, if you identify God with that triune being which is eternal and 
unchangeable in his being, and so forth, by himself, then of course you have no salvation. Then you have no Christ. That kind of a God is dead as far as you are concerned. So what he says, I have actualized this doctrine of God. I have opened up the resources of salvation. How have I done it? Well, he doesn't say Allah can't. That's actually the state of affairs. He has done it in the sense that he says God is his revelation. Now notice the word is again. You see how it means not God is something as triune personal God in himself apart from and prior to this revelation. But God is identical with the act of revelation. And that means that God is his revelation in Christ. God is Christ, the revealer. And he is at the same time Christ, the revealed. Now, that means something as far as the attributes is concerned, the attributes of God, he says, the orthodox people, and he sets his doctrine of the attributes very clearly, opposed to his own, he says, they had a hard time to organize these attributes. They have God, they say God is eternal, and he's this, he's movable, he's righteous, he's holy, and this and that. But he said they couldn't unify those attributes. Now, what we must do is we must unify them by the concept of grace, which is the all-comprehensive and the all-unifying attribute of God. Now, and then if you think of that grace as being identical with the act of Jesus Christ, then you see that God, who is, as he says, inherently gracious, whose being is to be gracious, whose being is inherently love and grace, that unifies all of your other attributes. And all other attributes are subordinate to this one attribute of divine grace. Now, how does that influence us, and what does it mean to us? Well, it means already the groundwork is being laid for his soteriology, which is universalistic in the nature of the case. Here is grace. Now, all these modernists, he says, Schleiermacher and Ritchell, these consciousness theologians, they have had a very low view of the attribute of God's righteousness and of God's holiness. We must really say God is holy, and we must say God is righteous. And therefore, the wrath of God is upon us. We are down here, and we're sinners, and we're under the wrath of God because we have offended the holiness of God his law, his holy nature, and we are therefore subject to condemnation. We are under damnation. We are reprobate. Now, all of that, does it sound Calvinistic? At least people think it does. And in, in any case, you see, it sounds as though he means business with sin. Now, he says sinners are bad. Now, he says lightness who had this famous idea, this is the best possible world, made light of evil and of sin, and so has philosophy, modern philosophy, so has immanentistic modern theology, modernist theology of Schleiermacher and Ritchell. But we must stress anew, as the Reformers did, the terribleness of sin and the wrath of God upon sin, and that people are on the way to destruction. They are utterly undone, and we must go beyond the Reformers. The Reformers sort of stop short, as they always stop short, of going all the way. They're always docetic. They don't really have God come into this world altogether and go under in this world. But now, we must say, not only that men, some men remain under the wrath of God, but we must say that all men, believers, as well as unbelievers, are and remain under the wrath of God. Now, don't you see that's how Calvin in Calvin, as it seems, isn't it? I mean, it seems as though he has a deeper, and what he thinks is a more biblical, attitude toward the idea of sin and its horribleness and its worthiness and its man's unworthiness as a sinner. Well, however... Don't you see? Grace is the unifying attribute. And that attribute of grace is above 
Therefore, the attribute of holiness. And therefore, though man is under the wrath of God because he has offended the holiness of God, nevertheless, the grace of God shines through that wrath of God. And the wrath of God is a manifestation of the grace of God, which is easily illustrated by the fact that parents parents spank their children. They want to improve them. They want to get them to get over bad habits. And they want them to learn the attitude of showing obedience and the proper relationship to their parents. And so they may thank them very hard. And if they have a very naughty child, one more so than the other, they'll spank that one harder. But they don't go out of doors and pick up their neighbor's children and spank them. They haven't any right to do so, nor are they interested in doing so. They do not love their neighbor's children the way they love their own children. Now, God spanks his children very, very hard. In other words, in Bart's theology, God spanks the children harder than they've ever been spanked before. But he does not throw them out to the crocodile. They are, to be sure, under the wrath of God, but they are even more comprehensively, when they are under the wrath of God, they are still under the grace of God. They couldn't get out from under the grace of God. Just no more than a child, even if it leaves home and goes west, can altogether escape the love of his father and mother. So no human being, you see, can escape the love of God and the grace of God. Now, that is already indicative, of course, of what we shall find in a moment of his universalism. The, the foundation for that is laid particularly in this doctrine of God and of grace as being inherently universal. Now, in the second part of this second volume, he deals with election. Now, then we have, of course, the very interesting phenomenon that here is once more in modern form a man who is a believer in election. And for a moment, Reverend Herman Hoekstra in Grand Rapids thought he had found a friend because here was a man who believed not only in election but in double election and who was a supra lapsarian in his conception of election. Now, he has a long discussion of supra and infra, and he talks about the Senate of Dort and other people, including a man named Van Til in those early days who was pretty much a liberal, unfortunately. I don't know whether I descend from him or not. I hope not. Uh, at any rate, what he finds is this. You see, inherently, the all-comprehensive attribute is grace. Very well. Now, God is, God is the electing God. He is not something first. He is not a God, a triune God who exists in himself and then has a plan in himself. And according to that plan, he elects some to eternal life and he elects some not to eternal life. No, he is the electing God. He, Christ is the electing God. Well, what does it mean to say that Christ is the electing God? It means there is nothing beyond Christ. And at this point, he in particular scores the Orthodox for having a God, a triune God, a sovereign God, who has a plan according to which, prior to the consideration of men's relationship to Christ, he elects or rejects people. And he speaks of Calvin's God as having the face of a threat of an ogre. Because that's the kind of a God nobody can live with. And then that the Orthodox people have not any comfort of the gospel. The comfort of the gospel comes from the fact that God is nothing but the electing God and that Christ is the electing God. And that in the nature of the case, that means you don't have to look beyond Christ. You can't look beyond Christ. And there's no possibility that you need to worry about not being elected. You see, there isn't any possibility even that you could be not elect because that's the only thing you know of God. Just like a child comes to his father or mother, no matter how naughty he's been, he'll say, give me a spanking, Dad, and he goes and bends over. 
and he gets a spanking, but then he knows that he is accepted again of his father or mother. Well, so in the nature of the case, Christ is the electing God. Corresponding to that, Christ is the elected man. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means by that that there are no men that are not in Christ, that are not elected in Christ. Well, you say, didn't you say a moment ago that he believes in reprobation? Oh, certainly he does. And therefore, he stresses, he thinks, much more than others have before him. The idea of the terribleness of sin, that men are under the wrath and condemnation of God. And there, but he says men are elect in Christ as the reprobate. Christ is the reprobate for them. He is, he goes into reprobation. That's the incarnation that God goes wholly under. And when Jesus was on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then it was God who was forsaken of himself. And therefore, he has God himself has borne for men, for all men inherently, their God-forsakenness. Now that means, he says, that he has put new presuppositions under the election. Now that's the very word he uses, new presuppositions under the traditional doctrine. He discusses the historic supra, the historic infra, or efforts that were made to combine them. He says, well, I hold to what he calls it purified supraleftarianism. Well, how does it purify superleftarianism? By means of Kant's philosophy, of course. That's how you purify theology. If any of you want to purify your theology, read the critique der Reinen Vernunft. That is to say, you have purified this in denying that there is a God in himself that has a counsel in himself that is the ultimate determiner of the destiny of individual men. You say that God is his revelation in Christ, and that means that he goes down into reprobation and that we are all reprobate. doesn't mean that, that Esau is reprobate and Jacob is not reprobate. One of the changes, one of the new re- presuppositions that he puts under the doctrine of election is to the effect that it does not pertain to persons. It's not that some are elect and others are not elect. And so you see the whole dispute, the whole historic dispute about whether you're infra or supra doesn't really make any longer any difference because it's not on the same foundations that he is thinking at all. Now, therefore, we are all reprobate, all of us, and we all reprobate to the dying, to our dying day. You can't say, looking at Romans, and say there is now no condemnation for Christ, those in Christ Jesus. And I'm one of those for whom Christ Jesus died. And and now he has borne the penalty that was due to me for my sin. And I am no longer under the class of reprobate. I am under the the class of those that are saved. There is no class of saved people and another class of not saved people. I said before when he was in Hungary, Somebody asked him, and what about these pagan masses? Are they lost? He says, that riecht nach Holland, that smells like Holland, where they divide people up into elect and non-elect, and that's terrible. Well, the point being that, therefore, it does not pertain to persons. And the second change that he introduces is that the penultimate word next to the last syllable is reprobation, but the ultimate word is salvation, and that for all. Now you see how this completely corresponds to the notion that God is wholly revealed and wholly hidden. God is wholly hidden in the sense that he hides his face of love and of grace to all men, and nobody must say that he thinks that he knows that he is saved. But on the other hand, even when he hides his face, like a father frowns when he punishes his child, and he says, you're a naughty boy, and I'm going to lift you, and this hurts me more than it hurts you. Well, nevertheless, don't you see, after a while, the child goes running out, and he knows that his father's face is smiling upon him again, and that his father will now protect him, and if there are any dangers outside, the father will take care of him. So now then, all are elect. 
I told you once before, I'll tell it once and never again, that when I saw Dr. Bart in Princeton and in the evening on the Friday, he would been there Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'd heard him Monday and Tuesday, and Dr. Stonehouse and I went to hear him again Friday, and I'd hoped to see him and at least shake hands with him. Uh, then Bill Jones, who was a Baptist minister, an old friend of mine, said to me at the beginning, he says, I, doc- I saw Dr. Bart. I had him in my car. I picked him up, you know, how American fundamentalists and their freedom of manners. <laughs> he was a great dignified German theologian on the sidewalk. Won't you get a ride? Have a ride. So he comes in. And then he told him, I know Dr. Van Til. He's a friend of You know Van Til? You know Van Til? Tell him he's a bad boy. He's not going to heaven. Now, this was, but that was, that was the penultimate. That was the penultimate. That was in the afternoon. Now, in the evening, then I didn't expect to see him anymore. I thought he had gone out, but they had taken him to a side room. And then when he came out with Dr. McCord, the president of Princeton, and somebody else, this other person said to Bart, here's Dr. Fentil. Are you Fentil? Are you Fentil? Are you? Three times. And he says, you say some, you said some bad things about me, but I forgive you. I forgive you. He patted me on the shoulder. Now, that was his penultimate word. I mean, his ultimate word. So I am going to heaven by the grace of Carl Bart. I hope also, and I know, by the grace of God. But I'm... You may think that I'm doing this only for laughs, but I'm really also basically doing so you'll understand what his theology is. Don't you see? That the worst of sinners can be forgiven. And he does write in the introduction to one of his volumes that things are getting better because in the Netherlands they used to be all against them until that grosses book of Berkauer, The Triumph of Grace, and some American fundamentalists you can even talk with. Ah, but he mentioned pressure, so an ausgenommen sign. He mentioned pressure. The, the cannibal, zum Beispiel, Einer, that was this humble gentleman, had said that he was the greatest of all heretics. Well, I didn't quite say that. I said that you can be a greater heretic in modern times since Kant has lived, and he is, oh, I'm not a modalist. I'm not a modalist. No, but he's worse than a modalist. That is to say, he does not believe in the triune God in the Christian sense. Therefore, you can deny that you're a modalist, like the early church modalist, but you are nonetheless a denier of the triune God in a deeper sense than the modalists even were, don't you see? Well, now then, let's go on to volume three. Now, when you come to volume three, you'll have the doctrine of man. And the doctrine of man is, of course, once more the same thing over with a slightly different word. Every one of these volumes is arranged like this. God speaks to man, and man responds, and Christ is at the center. God is the revealer. Christ, uh, Christ is the revealer. Christ is the revealed. There is no God in himself. There is no man in himself. God is what he is in his relation to man. Man is what he is in his relation to God through Christ. So God is the electing. Christ is the electing God. And we are the elect one in that we are elected in Christ. Now, his third volume, which is on the nature of man. Well, that starts over again by telling us, and he's frank to say so, that he repeats. Now, he's the most amazingly fertile writer. I mean, he has more words, and he knows more history and all of that than anybody I know. But he can nevertheless not do any more than say the same thing over again. Now, what he's saying is God is in Christ the real man. Christ is the real man. And we are mit Menschen Jesu. Mit Menschen Jesu. Fellow men with Christ. We are participants in the true manhood of Christ. Now notice how in saying this he is once again rejecting the historic orthodox position which says that God was in himself, that God created the world, that he made man, that man was given 
was put into contact of communication with God, God spoke to man. Then the historic fall, all that steam, he rejects. Says that's not Christological. That starts from a God in himself apart from Christ and starts with a man in himself apart from Christ. What we must do and what the reformers really meant to do, though they didn't have good terminology with which to say it, and they often fell into that profana as gift in the language. Nevertheless, what they really meant was that Christ is the real man. Now, therefore, God in Christ turns into the opposite of himself. We've already seen that God's attributes, he says that under the attributes too, God's uh, uh, eternity does not mean that God cannot change into the opposite of himself. And when it comes to the incarnation, in this, he discusses that almost at every point. He says the incarnation talks about the divine nature. I mean, the Chalcedon Creed talks about the divine nature and the human nature. Aspenguitos, Atreptos, Adiarectos, Atoristos. I'm going to have Mr. DeYoung give me 10% credit for knowing those Greek, four Greek words. Now, uh, he says what actually is true is that God does turn into the opposite of himself and that it is his nature to do so. It is not as though there is a divine nature which is of itself and has characteristics of itself prior to its manifestation in this world. God is his revelation and therefore to be with and to communicate himself to man is part of his essence. Orthodoxy has an essence of God, which is eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. But we have, he says, the Bible has an essence which is expressed exactly in the fact that coexistence is part of his existence. Coexistence, existence with man, in man, and through man. That is his essence. Now, you see again that little word is. You see what it means. It means an act of God's whole being exhaustively expressed in his relationship to man. Now, therefore, we must actualize the incarnation. Now, that being the case, then we can understand what man is. Then man is man in the event of Christ, who is the re electing God. He is that. That's what God is. Christ is the electing God. So what is man? Well, he is the fellow elect one, the one who is elected in Christ. That's his manhood. He is not first in Adam, a man and he doesn't therefore fall into sin in Adam as his representative. And then if he hears the gospel in it by the grace of God and the regenerating power of the Spirit he accepts and receives, then he is redeemed unto God from the wrath to come. No, for Bach, this is all in metaphysical terms. Man is mit mens Jesu. Well, we're at the end. Is it out? We'll stop at this point then. It's just about...